trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, amen. We will go ahead and have our scripture reading from Exodus this morning. Good morning. Our reading is Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain about us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails come up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I had a friend who had a dog and I uh, went over to her house one day and the dog came up to me and and uh, very friendly dog very lovely little girl and I found out that the dog's name was Mana and I said why why in the world did you call her Mana and she said, well, it's because we don't know what kind of breed of dog she is. So we keep asking ourselves every day when the dog comes to us, what is it today? Is it a greyhound mix? Is it a pit bull mix? What is it? And to this day, I still don't know what Mana was, but she was a lovely dog. And um, for all of you that have mixed breed dogs, um, they are wonderful pets. I have, I've had several. so. Um, but anyway, this week, we're going to be uh, taking one last look at Exodus. And then we will be going to the Gospel of Matthew starting next week. And I'm kind of reviewing a little bit in my mind about our journey through first Genesis and then uh, Exodus in, in the Old Testament. Uh, when uh, I look at the hymns that I pick out. I know that there have been hymns that some of you were not real familiar with. And 
part of the reason is because the hymns that I think we all know and love uh, have Jesus as the main theme. And while Jesus certainly is present um, kind of in a hidden way in the Old Testament, uh, most of the hymns that we've sung definitely focus on God. So uh, if you are waiting um, impatiently um, for those hymns about Jesus that you know and love, you might get lucky next week. (laughs) So maybe, I don't know, depends on what the Lord says to me. Okay, so when we last left uh, Moses and the Israelites, they had just had this absolutely miraculous escape from the Egyptians, right? So they were um, going to cross the sea and uh, Moses lifted up his hand and the Lord divided the waters and the Israelites crossed over safely. The Egyptians in their chariots followed them But then when the word came from the Lord, Moses put down his hands and the sea enveloped the Egyptians and their chariots. And this is something that is really just miraculous. And to kind of commemorate this, Um, thinking about the fact that the Egyptians um, had enslaved the Israelites for over 400 years, the Israelites had a celebration. And Moses and the Israelites, led by Miriam on her tambourine, sang a beautiful song of praise to the Lord in Exodus 15. And I would encourage you to read it, because really it it is pretty miraculous. Beautiful, beautiful song. And they were commemorating this amazing victory that they had over their oppressors. And they praised the mighty work of the Lord. They recognized that the Lord was the one who saved them. And really, it's like a wonderful, shining moment when the Israelites recognize the Lord and all that the Lord has done for them, and they show their great love for the Lord. You know, and it's, it's like us. You know, we have those good days where, you know, really we do our best for the Lord. And then we have near the end of chapter 15 in Exodus where things start to change. And... It's really kind of startling when you just had this amazing hymn of praise to the God, and then you have the end of Exodus 15, where we have what I would call an audit taking place between the Israelites and their God. Another way you could say it, I guess, is that, well, honey, the honeymoon is over. And so we have the Hebrew people doing an audit concerning the Lord. So we start off after the singing is done and they start walking and they walk a lot. On the third day on the road out of Egypt in the middle of the wilderness, the complaining starts and the Israelites, a small group of them, start to complain to Moses because Moses represents the spokesperson of the Lord. And the people were thirsty. And when they arrived at a place that would later be called Mara, they couldn't drink the water there because it was bitter. And Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed Moses a piece of wood that was nearby that Moses was to throw into the water, and then the water would be made drinkable. And sure enough, that happened. And the people, even though their thirst was now satisfied, they were continuing their audit. They were reviewing and examining the situation that they were in. And they believed that the Lord and his servant Moses were coming up short 
on their audit. And in the return, that was not meant to be a tax reference, the Lord lets the people know that God is in fact doing the same thing, that God is auditing the people. And in verse 26 of chapter 15, the Lord says, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And if you remember how this worked while the Israelites were in Egypt, they were spared from the plagues that the Lord brought upon the Egyptians. They were not harmed. They did not become sick like the people and their animals did. Um, they had their lives saved and the firstborn of the Israelites were not killed. So the Lord is telling the people, you audit me, I audit you. And so a little bit of time passes, and we come to today's scripture in which we have not just a small group complaining, but the whole congregation, okay, of the Israelites complaining against not just Moses, but also Aaron and God as they are traveling through the wilderness. And now it is day 15. And... The water that they have brought with them is now gone, and the food that they brought out of Egypt is now all eaten away. And they give a complaint after auditing the situation that is really quite dramatic. And they say, oh, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now what are you going to do? When we read this text, one word that really kind of stands out that I had to kind of do a deep dive on and um, ask some people who know much better than I do uh, about the word flesh pots. I found that to be a really strange word in this text. And um, scholars believe that what the Israelites were talking about when they said the word flesh pot is they were referring to these pots or these large metal kettles that were used to cook meat. Okay, however, however, it should be noted that typically, like a lot, um, the slaves would not be fed meat. Okay, they did not have access to meat. So it certainly, again, adds to the drama of what the Israelites are saying and complaining about to God. Oh, you're going to kill us all. You're going to kill us all. He just brought us out here to kill us all. Again, very dramatic, like some of my former students. <laughs> However, maybe we shouldn't be so hard on the Israelites because, you know, they are tired, I'm sure. They are hungry and they are scared. And they know very well that in order to get food, they know that it is a process. And you all in this area, um, being a part of this area, you know this too. Because when food is produced, it's a process that involves a lot of work from humanity. For example, the making of bread involves plowing, planting, tending, harvesting, processing, baking, packaging, marketing, buying, and the final preparation. That's a lot of work that's involved. And the Israelites were looking around and we're saying, well, how, this, how is this going to happen? 
How is this going to happen? And they forgot. And I think we sometimes forget, too, that we are dependent on the labor of others for the food that we eat. And here in the United States, we have tremendous access to food that not all countries have. And in addition to the human labor, there's also God's creation that we are dependent on. And when we eat, we ingest into ourselves the energy of the sun that is found in earth, plant, and animal life, as we will experience during our fall dinner. And these are God's gifts to us and God's gifts to all of life. These are the works of God's hands, of God's breath, and of God's word. We are dependent on both God's work and in human labor for the food that we eat and are gifted with. So the Israelites examined and reviewed all of this in their audit of God, Moses, and Aaron. Because they were used to food being provided to them. They worked, yes, but they did not work typically at the food that they ate. And just like the Israelites, we also can take for granted our access to food. We lose sight of how dependent we are on others for the food that we eat, and we forget how utterly and deeply dependent we are on God in whom we live and move and have our being. The audit that was being done on God, Moses, and Aaron involved what I would argue is a lot of selective memory. They are in a difficult place. The Hebrews are coming face to face with their fragility. All the food that they have brought with them out of Egypt is now gone. They are afraid. They are angry. And they use their selective memory to remember Egypt as a place and where they had plenty to eat. And that probably was not 100% true. And now they have to deal with these incompetent leaders and an incompetent God who has led them into the wilderness where they, according to their dramatic complaint, will starve. And as they audit the situation, they give Moses and Aaron a piece of their ever-loving minds. And while this type of deep examination of God is going on through this audit, I would also argue that another type of audit is going on at the same time. And I would argue that the people are auditing God as a student would audit a class. As a student at Wesley Theological Seminary, I have the opportunity to audit classes. I haven't had the chance to do that yet. But I do know that some of my friends have audited class. And when they audited a class, they attended the course if they felt like it. And hey, if they felt like it. And they could do the work if they felt like it. And they didn't have to worry about getting a grade. The Hebrew people are not interested at this point really in developing a relationship with God. They want the benefits from God, but are not interested in doing the work. The people do not understand their dependence on God and do not understand what it means to be in a relationship with God. They are not interested in learning more about God. They just want the gifts from God. Gimme, 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 gimme. Without doing the work. 
and they're not interested in giving God anything in return. God is a compassionate God. God sees the needs of the people and God responds to their needs by raining down quail at twilight and bread at dawn and giving the people the gifts of food and life. God is demonstrating that God desires to be in a relationship with the people, even though they are not giving God anything in return. Something to consider when looking at this text is perhaps discipleship is also being addressed. The Israelites were looking for salvation from God. God, save us. We're hungry. We're scared. Save us, save us, save us. But they didn't want to put in the time to be disciples of God. Do we struggle with the same thing in our relationship with God in Jesus Christ? And I think we have our days in which we do, where we say, God, save me, save me, save me, save me. Help me, help me, help me, help me. And we should cry out for help to the Lord when we need help. And we need to be careful not to get into that audit because just like when we audit a class, we go to get information, but we're not required to do any work. When you audit a class, you don't have to take the tests. You don't have to write the papers. You're attending the class for informational purposes, to get something out of the class. It's like you get the data from the expert who is teaching the class but there isn't any responsibility on your part to do anything with the data. And I think there are times in our lives when we audit God and when we audit each other and when we audit the church. And we need to be really careful about that. And we use God and we use each other for that data, but we don't do anything meaningful with the data to pursue deeper relationships with each other and with God and with folks in our community. And we don't use the data that we get to advance the kingdom of God on earth. And it's easy to forget how dependent we are on each other and on God. You know, we think we are lone rangers. And I know I, I thought of this being a single person. You know, that I can do this on my own. I don't need no help from anybody. Okay, but we are dependent on God and we are dependent on each other. And we need to be in mutual relationships with each other to help each other out. And we need to be careful when the audits start happening. We need to be careful that we don't go into manipulation of God and of each other to get what we want, to get that data. That's not what God wants from us or from each other. According to this text, God's intent in providing daily bread to the people concerns both our physical and our spiritual welfare. Even though the people of God were auditing God and were not interested in developing a meaningful relationship with God at this point, God didn't reciprocate on that. God starts the relationship with the people by providing for their physical needs. And then we'll move into the spiritual. And God does this in this way. God provides daily bread for the people to provide for them physically. 
and with providing the daily bread, God provides a daily blessing for the people as they depend on God daily for their food. Just like in Jesus's prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Doesn't just mean the bread. Doing this daily by thanking God for our daily bread helps the people to remember who God is. The only person we need to audit is ourselves. And we need to do this by looking at ourselves and asking, are we alive physically and spiritually? Do we need to audit ourselves and to check our motivations in our relationships with God and with each other? Do we need to recall the amazing works that God has done in our lives and remember how dependent we are upon God and on each other? Because we live, we breathe, and we have our being in God, the God who forgives and loves us. Amen. Please stand if you are able, and we will sing together. And are we yet alive? Uh, found